Okay, so why don't we uh, go ahead and start to get started here, and then people can kind of jump on as they jump on. <clears throat> so I'm Jeff Urban, the Education Director at the Roosevelt Presidential Library and Museum, and on behalf of our director, Paul Sparrow, and the rest of the staff at the Roosevelt Presidential Library, I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us today. Today's presentation is going to be about the history of presidential libraries, you know, what it is we do, the kinds of things that we have, and, um, you know, why these things are, are so important. And, um, you know, you may have, um, you know, driven by a presidential library or thought about a presidential library and said, well, what do they do there? Well, let's start with the, uh, the beginning. Um, Roosevelt uh, had this idea that, um, well, the, the, let, what I'm talking about is the name. So let's start first with the name library. Okay, so when people think presidential library, they think, well, library, I can go in and check out books, right? Um, but we're not that kind of a library. We do have books, but you can't check them out. So you say, all right, presidential library. So I can go in and check out presidents? No, you can't do that either. What we have are materials that relate to the Roosevelt presidency. And when President Roosevelt used the term library, he was using it in the broadest sense of the word. He was using it from the sense of a library is a place that collects information and we can go to those places and learn. So when we say presidential library, that's what we mean. So let's get that out of the way first and foremost. Now the story of presidential libraries themselves actually start with none other than George Washington, our nation's very first president. And Washington had, you know, gotten us through the uh, American Revolution, eight years of hardship and uncertainty and chaos, thousands of deaths, tens of millions of dollars spent. And he realized that, well, now that we are this country, you know, now that we've defeated England and we are our own country, this better work. Because if it doesn't, the British are going to be back and they're going to be coming back and they're going to be hanging us founding fathers for breaking up with them and, you know, creating our own country. So uh, Washington really understood how important it was that the, the new democracy work. And so when we elected him to be our president, he said, all right, um, this really needs to happen. This really needs to work. So everything I do is going to set a, a, a precedent for the folks who follow me in office. Now, I think I can do a pretty good job because you know, I was head of the Continental Congress, head of the Continental Army. I was a big shot landowner back in Virginia. I got this covered. But what about the folks who follow me? Could we have spent all those lives, all that money, all that time, all that hardship for nothing? This has got to work. So Washington was very cognitive of that when he was um, creating the presidency for the first time. And one of the uh, things that he did was he set a tradition of the two-term limit. Right? Washington was president and then got reelected. And at the end of his second term, he said, well, it's time for somebody else. We don't want to go down this King Road, this uh, King George Road again. We want to make sure that we get some, some new blood in here. So that created the tradition of the two-term limit for the presidency. That was a political tradition from Washington all the way on up to uh, the 22nd Amendment, which went into effect in 1953, which now makes it um, that the president can only serve two terms plus picking up two other term or two other years from another president's term. He was also very um, uh, thoughtful about how he wanted to go about creating uh, the, the president's ability to do the job. And so he created a thing called executive order. Now, the executive order doesn't exist in the Constitution. But George Washington was now the chief executive. He was a general used to giving orders. And so when he gave these things, they became executive orders. And the justification for that comes from Article 2, Section 1 and Section 3 of the Constitution, where it says that the, um, the president uh, has certain powers vested in him and that it is up to him to see the laws are faithfully executed. So the executive order created uh, that way. And the third thing Washington wanted to do was he said, well, maybe the best way to prepare whoever follows me in office is to have them have access to my papers. That way they can go through these documents and see what it is that I've done. So, you know, they can go through, see what I created, see what we did. If there's a question with a treaty with, you know, a different country, they can go back and actually look at that document. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all my papers back with me to Mount Vernon and I'm going to organize them so they could be used by future presidents. So he packed up all of his charts and graphs and letters and memos and reports, and he took them all back to Mount Vernon with the hopes of organizing them so they could be used by future presidents. But unfortunately, he died before he had a chance to organize his papers. 
And with George Washington died, the concept of the presidential library up until Franklin Roosevelt. Now, you might say, well, you know, what happened to those papers? Well, a lot of those papers were actually destroyed. And usually if you ask someone, you know, what would destroy, um, you know, historic papers, they're going to say fire. And fire is the best wrong answer. Because, of course, back in those days, there was no 911 or fire companies. So if the fire broke out of your house, you were in big trouble. But the things that actually destroyed um, George Washington's papers is they actually ended up looking kind of like this. And they were destroyed by rats. Yeah, it was rats that came in and ate a lot of George Washington's papers. Now, George Washington was a fancy guy, and so he wrote on fancy parchment paper. So the rats just couldn't help themselves. And they ate through a lot of our early history. Hey, don't you have to get off to the races? All right, see you later. So <clears throat> along with George Washington is buried the idea of the presidential library, but every president followed the tradition of taking their papers with them. Sometimes the papers were left in hot, uh, dry attics, which are not good conditions for documents. Sometimes they were placed in wet, damp basements, which are also not good conditions for uh, the preservation of documents. Sometimes if a, if a document had the presidential signature on it, it might be cut off, sold for its uh, autograph value, and the document simply discarded. There are actually reports that Robert Todd Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln's son, became ashamed of his father who was born in a log cabin after Robert Todd Lincoln became a big shot in the Pullman Railroad Company. So he tried to erase a lot of his, his dad's history. Well, this continued on and then um, along comes President Roosevelt and he gets us through the Great Depression. Now Roosevelt realizes that we've never seen anything like a Great Depression before and he knows that future historians are gonna wanna know how we got through it. So he says, oh, I better preserve my papers. So he calls the Library of Congress and he says, you guys want my papers? And they say, well, how many do you have? And when he tells them how many he has, uh, they say, well, we don't have room for all that. How about we take a little of this, a couple of those, a few of these, and we'll take a random sample and we'll, we'll collect it that way. And Roosevelt says, no, you need to take everything or you need to take nothing. It's important that these collections stay together. So the Library of Congress says, all right, we won't take anything. So Roosevelt is now stuck with a dilemma. What's he going to do with his papers? Well, he decides to build his very own presidential library right on his property in Hyde Park. And he uh, takes his hat, passes it around to friends and associates, and he collects $376,000 to build the nation's first presidential library. This becomes a model by which all presidential libraries are built. So it doesn't cost you and me, the taxpayers, anything to build a presidential library. It's all privately raised money. Once the library is complete and the papers are installed, it's then given over to the National Archives and Records Administration. And that's who we actually work for uh, here in Hyde Park. But we work at the Roosevelt Presidential Library. Now, this is a copy of a sketch that FDR drew of how he wanted his presidential library to look. And you can see um, it's a rough sketch and uh, it's dated down here, uh, April 12, 1939, FDR's initials. It's got a large sloping roof up here on the top. It's got uh, a nice inviting porch along here. It's covered in Dutchess County Fieldstone and it's got these big windows down here. And this is what he wanted the presidential library to look like. So he gave this over to a uh, architect who then came up with an actual architectural design and the building was completed and it looks like this. And this is exactly what it looks like on a beautiful day. And you'll notice it's got many of those same features that Roosevelt included in his original sketch. It's got the large sloping roof, which is part of the Dutch colonial architectural style. It's got large windows down here in the bottom. It's built around a nice inviting porch and it's covered in Dutchess County Fieldstone. Now inside this building, ladies and gentlemen, houses the presidential archives. And when Roosevelt tried to give these over to the Library of Congress, they didn't have enough space because in our collection, in our archives, we have 17 million pages of documents. That would be a stack, not as tall as one Washington monument, not as tall as two Washington monuments, but if you stack them all on top of each other, it'd be a stack 16 times as tall as the Washington monument. And that's a lot of documentation and a lot of primary sources that you can gain information from. And that's exactly what this presidential library is designed to do. Now, our collection, these documents are kept in what are called Hollinger boxes. 
And this is what they look like in their natural habitat. And you'll notice that uh, they're all sitting there nicely on a shelf. Some of them have little strings that come out. Some of them have little holes. That's so the archivist can get them off the shelves uh, quite easily. And I happen to have an actual box with me. This is called a Hollinger box. And it's designed with reinforced metal corners. And it's got sort of a clamshell design. So the, the idea is when you shut this down, it shuts out all the light. So the documents are able to uh, be preserved that way. And it's got the little string that pulls off from the side there. Now, Roosevelt builds the first presidential library, but every president after him decides, wow, that's a great idea. I'm going to build a presidential library as well. And so this chart here shows the presidential library system as it exists today. Now, you, those of you that are astute observers of this chart will notice, wait a minute, isn't that uh, Herbert Hoover over here? Didn't you say that Roosevelt built the first presidential library? What's Hoover doing on the chart? Well, Hoover finds himself with some free time after 1933. So he goes back and he builds a presidential library. So if you go in presidential order, they start with Herbert Hoover. If you go in um, order of the way they were built, they start with our guy, Franklin Roosevelt. And every president since then has built uh, a presidential library. Now, in order to understand presidential libraries, we need to take a little look at some of the official acts that uh, helped to bring these things about. In 1939, Roosevelt creates the first presidential library, building his presidential library toward the end of his second term, right? Trying to stick with that uh, tradition set by George Washington of the two-term limit. But by 1939, 1940, Roosevelt's concerned with two things. Number one is his domestic policy agenda, the New Deal. The New Deal began to be challenged in the second term through the courts. And some of the things were actually overturned, things like the first Agricultural Adjustment Act and the National Recovery Administration. So he was afraid that if there wasn't a strong Democrat to follow himself in office, that his New Deal programs would be dismantled. The other thing he was concerned about was Adolf Hitler. And one of the cool things of history is that Franklin Roosevelt and Adolf Hitler come to power within about six weeks of each other, and they die within about six weeks of each other. So Hitler and Roosevelt come to power within about the same time frame. And uh, what Roosevelt wants to do is to uh, make sure that we're not breaking in a new president when um, you know Hitler is getting ready to take over the world. So what he decides to do, Roosevelt, is to run for the third term to protect his domestic legacy and also to protect against uh, Adolf Hitler. What this does is it allows our presidential library to be the only presidential library used while the president was actually president because he built it toward the end of his second term, fully expecting to retire the presidency as everybody had going back to Washington, but then ran for the third term and then ran for a fourth term because we were in the war by that point. And um, he used that library the entire third term and 83 days uh, of his, his fourth term. And so that created the presidential library. Then in 1955, Congress established a system for creating presidential libraries as Harry Truman decided that he was going to create one. And then the presidential, uh, the presidents uh, uh, began to build their presidential libraries after that. In 1978, the Presidential Papers Act was passed. And this was passed largely as a result of the Watergate scandal with Richard Nixon. When Nixon was getting ready to resign the presidency, he packed up all of his charts and graphs and letters and reports, and uh, there may even have been a box of tapes. And he said, you know, I'm getting out of here. And the Congress said, not so fast, pal. You're under criminal investigation for obstruction of justice. We want to see what you've got in those documents. And there was a famous lawsuit, the uh, people of the United States versus Richard Nixon. And the papers were removed from the White House and placed in College Park, Maryland, where they then stayed for the next 35 or 40 years. The Presidential Papers Act changed the law, uh, or actually created a law that said, now presidential papers belong to us, the people of the United States. And that was enacted during uh, the Carter administration and went into effect uh, during the, um, the Reagan administration. So now um, the presidential papers are the property of us. Now, along with that 
piece of legislation. There was a, about a 12 year tail that the, the papers would remain sealed. Um, and the idea of that was just to give them time to sort of get through with them and see what was in there and, you know, uh, get a sense of what was going on uh, in the, uh, in the documents before they would be opened. And then after the 12 year period, they could be then to be opened um, at that point. Well, that's the way it went all the way on up until November of uh, 2001. Two months after the attack on 9-11, George Bush issued an executive order, 13233, which then extended that tale to be essentially forever. The idea being that there were so many facts and figures and information in these presidential papers that we really needed a lot more time to go through them before we could let them out, uh, you know, and be opened and, and available to folks. Because, you know, with the terrorism threat, we didn't want these, these documents, these papers, um, to be used by uh, nefarious forces. Well, lawsuits began because, hey, it's democracy. We're supposed to be able to get access to these papers. That was George Washington's whole idea, was to allow us to see how the nation makes decisions, how the government makes decisions. And before we could reach a, a critical point, like with the Supreme Court, uh, President Barack Obama became president. And in his first full day in office, he issued an executive order 13489, which rescinded George Bush's uh, executive order. And things went largely back to the way they were um, from the Presidential Papers Act in 1978. So that is the legislation that led up to the creation of the Presidential Library and the history of um, how uh, President Roosevelt uh, played a role in creating that. So we've got a Presidential Library, but what do you find in this thing? Well, basically, um, you find things that fall into three categories. There's documents, there are photographs, and there are objects. And one of the things I like to do when I work with school children is to show them this particular uh, document. This is a copy of FDR's birth announcement. Now FDR was born at home, so there's no proper birth certificate, but this is the announcement that his father sent out. And this is in fact a document. It looks more like a picture really, but what I like to show the students with this is look how much information we can get from this one document. So we know that his name was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. So we know his middle name. We're able to determine he was born on the 30th of January, 1882. We know that his mother and father were Mr. and Mrs. James Roosevelt. So middle name, birth date, and who his parents are, right? So very three critical uh, important pieces of information. We also know if we look over here on the actual bundle that the stork is gonna bring, it says FDR. So we know that FDR's initials, um, the FDR that we all know him by, that was not something political that he picked up along the way, but it was coming right from the time of his birth. His father was referring to him as FDR. We also can see up here, if you look very closely on the stork, it says Hyde Park, New York. So the stork knows where to deliver FDR. Imagine the scandal if he'd been delivered next door. So from one document, we can find where FDR was born, who his parents were, what his middle name is, what his nickname was, and his date of birth. And if you can find all that out from one document, imagine the amount of information you can find out from 17 million pages of documents. And that's what it's all about, using these primary sources to find out information uh, about the Roosevelt era. So I want to share some of the um, things that we have in our collection uh, with you. And basically, our library is set up in uh, four departments. There is the archives department, which is in charge of the archives, and our supervisory archivist uh, is Kirsten Carter, and she and her staff do a fine job of preserving and presenting the papers for scholars and ordinary citizens to learn about the Roosevelt era. We have a museum department headed up by Herman Eberhardt, and he and his team do a fantastic job of creating the uh, displays and the exhibits that you see uh, in the museum that tell the story of the Roosevelt era. And especially since we did our renovation, we now have a special space where we can do temporary exhibits. So we're able to present a lot more of the material that we have uh, in our collection. In our archive, we have something like 17 million pages of documents, something like 150,000 uh, photographs, 53,000 or so books, 23,000 or so of those belong to President Roosevelt himself. In the museum, 35,000 museum objects, a small fraction of which you'll see out at any given time. We just don't have the room to put them out there. 
Then there's the more public face of the library. And that would be me with the education department. And we do anywhere from 26,000 to 30,000 students per year who come on site and do actual programs with us. And it's anywhere from 4,000 to 8,000 distance learning uh, students from uh, all around the world. And we do this for second graders all the way up to college level kids. Um, and then also uh, adult learners, such as uh, many of you watching today. And then we also have public programs. And Cliff Lobby is our public programs uh, specialist. And last year, he did 58 programs throughout the course of the year. Everything from book talks to uh, movie events, speakers, the bivouac, the USO show, and of course, um, uh, our annual Roosevelt Reading Festival. So there's lots of interaction with the Presidential Library, um, and it all comes from those four simple departments who are, of course, um, overseen and coordinated by our director, uh, Paul Sparrow. So let's take a look at these categories that these things fall into, not from a department standpoint, but from what they actually are, documents, photographs, and objects. So we've seen FDR's birth announcement. Now let's take a look at FDR's report card. And if you take a look at this, this is from Groton School, and you can see that FDR got mostly B's and C's. And this gives the students who visit a lot of hope. All right, so it's not so important that you're necessarily a good student to become president, but you have to be hardworking and you have to make sure that you are, um, you know, addressing your studies in a way that even if you're not getting A's, you're learning what you need to learn. So the idea is that you can use these primary source documents to find out information about um, the presidents. Uh, we do this in three categories. We do it with documents, we do it with photographs, we do it with objects. And I'm so sorry we're having all of these connection problems, um, but we will continue to uh, try to uh, make this happen. And then we're gonna go to um, questions and answers uh, through the through the chats. So this is another document I want to share with you. It's the day of infamy speech and FDR uh, dictated this to his secretary who typed it up and then he made the handwritten corrections. Originally it was supposed to be a date that will live in world history and he crossed that out and he wrote uh, a date that will live in infamy and it becomes of course the famous day of infamy speech. But that to me as an educator is not as important as some of the other things about this first sentence. If you look at the first sentence, it says yesterday, December 7th, 1941. And what I like about that is that it shows you the president has 12 or 16 hours to think about what it is that he wants to say to the American public before he goes before Congress and says it. Now today, of course, you know, with all this instant communication, you know, you have to think on your feet and have, you know, the exact answer right away. But how many times have you said or done something that you wish you had had 12 or 16 hours to think about? Well, Roosevelt had that ability and had that time. And that's what I think uh, is very interesting about that first uh, sentence, that first word in that sentence. Also, what's very interesting here is he's got these little dashes, these little carrots and dashes here and over here. So what he says is yesterday, December 7th, 1941, and then he has this little pause, a date which will live in infamy, or that will, which will live in infamy, and then another dash. So he wants that statement to hang in the air. He wants that statement to stick with people. Roosevelt is giving himself stage direction in how it is that he wants to give that speech. So that's what we've got in terms of um, some, some uh, documents. We also have photographs. Here's a picture of FDR as a little boy and he's got long hair and he's wearing a smock. And that's because back in the day, that's how fancy people dressed their kids. And Mrs. Roosevelt thought she was fancy, felt she was fancy, and she was. Um, and so she dressed little Franklin like this. And then when he got a little older, she was able to, uh, he was able to talk her into cutting his hair and getting out of the smocks. And here he is in a kilt. So if you look at his face, he's not much too happier about that, but you know, he's definitely making some progress. And then also here's a picture of FDR as we probably have all come to know and love him. You know, the profile, the confident smile, the straight and sturdy jaw looking off into the future where he wants all of us to, to be. But this is a rare photo that we have here. This is a picture of FDR from the 1944 campaign and it's a color photo and you can notice those beautiful blue eyes. So move over there, Frank Sinatra. Here comes uh, FDR. Now, 
documents, photographs, objects. And some of the objects that we have, I want to skip right to this one here. One of the objects we have in our collection is FDR's wheelchair. And of course, this is just a model. The real ones are much bigger. And you'll notice it's nothing more than a kitchen chair the legs have been cut off of, placed on a metal frame with the big wheels in the front and the little wheels in the back. And FDR designed this himself and used this wheelchair to get from point A to point B. And once he got to point B, he would slide off here. Notice there's no arms on here. He would slide off into a more comfortable chair where he would then spend hours and hours working on the problems of the nation. So this was a, a, a device that he used uh, for transportation more than actually sitting around in uh, for much of the day. When FDR sat, he was sitting right on his, his butt bone because uh, his butt muscles had atrophied. And so it was very uncomfortable for him to stay in this chair. So we'd go from point A to point B. But you may also have noticed a little something over here on the side. And this is none other than FDR's ashtray. So FDR had his wheelchair built with a built-in ashtray. And as we always tell the children, FDR was a big-time smoker. And today he's dead. So keep that in mind. So these are the kinds of things that you're likely to find in a presidential library. What's the point of this whole thing? The point is to learn about history. The point is to find out what things were like during that time frame that the presidential uh, period covers, and then use the information to um, uh, direct us into directions here uh, in the future. So the idea is learn from the past to create the future. And that's exactly what FDR wanted these presidential libraries to be. And they are a wonderful place to come and learn. They're a wonderful place to come and visit. Uh, you don't have to necessarily agree with what the president did, um, but it is an opportunity to come and learn about why the president did those particular things. And we are the nation's oldest uh, presidential library, the nation's first presidential library. And we take a lot of pride in the fact that our president actually used our library while um, he was actually president, getting us through the two greatest cr crises of the 20th century. First, the Great Depression, and then, of course, the Second World War. So as soon as we open up again, you all please come out and visit us here at the Roosevelt Presidential Library in Hyde Park. And uh, we've just posted a new link on our Facebook feed for our new online artifacts collection. So you might want to take a look at that. And you can visit our website and see all sorts of wonderful things um, like our, our virtual tour and some of the materials that I've created for um, education purposes and also um, some of the archival stuff, um, uh, archival programs and things that uh, Cliff Lobby has produced for um, the website as well. So let's go over to questions and answers before we get cut off again. And I do apologize for the, the technology uh, glitches here. And let's see what we have. Okay, and it's looking like people are kind of phoning in here about, you know, why didn't anybody put presidential libraries, um, create one before that? Well, people didn't really think about it, right? Um, you know, presidents, they were taking their information with them as every president had done. George Washington had done that. And so they were just kind of following the, the precedent or their, their tradition. Now, many of those documents still exist but they exist not in one place. They exist in many places. Um, you know, uh, sometimes they were placed in uh, college or university collections. Sometimes they've been placed in um, um, uh, family collections. Uh, some of the places have actually gone back and sort of created presidential libraries, like the Lincoln Library uh, out in Illinois or the uh, Wilson Library in Princeton. And uh, they've kind of gone back and sort of put these things uh, back together. Those two places are not part of the National Archives and Records Administration. Um, and the National Archives and Records Administration, of course, is the same organization that houses the Constitution and the Declaration uh, of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and billions, literally billions of other pages uh, of documents. And so if you want to find out uh, information about what the government's doing or, you know, with the decisions that we've made in the past, um, the presidential libraries are a great place uh, to come and do that. Um, and, uh, you know, since then, that's exactly what we've done. The Presidential Papers Act has now made it official. And so um, we're saving these presidential papers so we can learn about 
things from the past. One of the things that, you know, sometimes you may have heard that expression that history repeats itself. Well, somebody once told me that it doesn't repeat itself so much as history echoes. So when you say hello in a cave and it comes back as hello, 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 right? It's the same thing, but it's coming back in a different direction. It's coming back with a different intensity. And that's kind of what hi uh, history does. History comes back to us in different directions and in different uh, intensities. And we can't always just apply the lessons we've learned in the past, the problems of today, because we don't have exactly the same problems of today. We have echoes of those problems. And so we can, uh, we need to take a look at this information, tweak it, bend it, shape it, and begin to uh, apply it to our present and, uh, and current uh, condition. Our research room is one of the busiest research rooms, uh, if not the busiest in the presidential library uh, system, something like 800 uh, uh, researchers come each year to learn about things that uh, the Roosevelt's did during the, um, their time in office. Because in many ways, we live in the world of the Roosevelt's, right? You know, the, um, the creation of the New Deal programs, the creation of the United Nations, uh, the post-war period, these are all things that uh, have their roots back in the uh, Roosevelt administration. So we're living still in the world of the Roosevelt's and to come to our presidential library is a great opportunity to learn about how these things came about why these things came about, what they were intended to do, and uh, then you can learn how they've changed over time uh, from there. Okay, I'm not seeing too many other questions coming in. Let me take a look here if I can uh, go down here a bit. Okay. Okay, here's a question. Um, any big exhibits upcoming? Well, we, the exhibit that we were trying to put in our temporary gallery right now um, was to commemorate um, the 75th anniversary of President Roosevelt's passing. And um, of course, we weren't able to open that yet because we got shut down with this, uh, with this pandemic. Not sure when we're going to open again. Please keep coming to our website and we'll keep you posted on information. Obviously, the most important thing is to open when it's safe to do so. Um, the history will be there um, and you know, we'll present it to you as, as quickly and as, as uh, soon as we, as we can. The, uh, Somebody's writing in about the car. Yeah, his car is awesome. It's one of our probably prized uh, museum objects. Um, it's the car that he used while he was in Hyde Park, especially modified, so he was able to use it with his uh, um, he had, uh, gears and levers that he was able to use to work the brake and the accelerator and such. So he was able to drive the car even though he doesn't have the use of his legs. The car was very important to him because it gave him a sense of freedom and mobility that he didn't have because of the polio. And it got to the point where one of his favorite things to do is the Secret Service would you know, lift him into the car. And uh, before they could get to their car, he would start his car, take off, and they'd lose him on the property. And so it got to the point where the Secret Service broke the property up into what they called upper woods, middle woods, and lower woods. And... Um, they kept the president safe that way by stationing agents in the upper woods, the middle woods and the lower woods. They were able to follow the president through with binoculars and bug sprays and radios and such. And it gave him a sense of sort of leaving things behind. You know, um, we're all sort of feeling a little cooped up right now, right? Because of the, the shutdown and such. You can imagine what it must be like, you know, uh, you're president of the United States and, you know, you're used to getting out there and doing things. And then all of a sudden he wasn't able to do it because of the polio. So the car, very, very important to, um, his sense of, of being able to get around uh, and to uh, to move around. Okay. Let's see here. Hmm. Someone's asking, what's one of my favorite little known things in the library? One of my favorite little known things in the library. Well, that's a great question. Um, one of the things I think that I, I like the most about the library um, and the things that we have in there um, are the day-to-day the -day objects that the president would use, things like the telephone, um, pens and pencil sets and desk sets and those sorts of things. Uh, Herman talked to you last week about the president's desk, and many of those things resided on that desk. But to think about you know, the Great Depression and the Second World War, the creation of the um, United Nations, the development of the atomic bomb being all used by those objects that you're able to go in and see right there 
uh, on the desk. And again, it's the day-to-day -day things I think that are, are pretty cool. I mean, yeah, there's you know fun stuff, but these are the things that President Roosevelt used to guide us through to the future that we're all living uh, today. Now, in terms of documents, what I love to look at when I look at uh, documents from our archives is so, so many times when you're looking at documents, you come across terms like our children, our future, future generations, those that follow us. These are all terms and phrases that the Roosevelt's use because they're always looking ahead. You know, they had the ability to see where they were and the problems that they had, but they also had the ability to see where they wanted us to be. And then the idea was they created the bridge for us to get there. So when I see terms like our children, our future, future generations, those that follow us, it, it really makes me feel kind of humble because it puts me in mind of the fact that they were thinking about us, right? They were thinking about me. They were thinking about you. We are the generations that they were creating a better world for. We are the generations that they were planning for and sacrificing for in their own time. And we are benefiting, um, you know, from that today. So that's one of the cool things I like to see um, when I look at the um, the exhibits that we have and the documents that, uh, that we have there uh, as well. Okay. President Roosevelt uh, also has in his collection uh, a number of books, about 23,000. And one of the things that he loved about uh, collecting, um, he loved to collect naval prints and he loved to collect naval uh, books. And so here is an example of, of something that he might have with that. President Roosevelt loved sailing. He loved the sea. He loved the ocean. And, um, you know, he, uh, he wanted to actually go to Annapolis, but his mother wouldn't let him. So he uh, ended up not going there, but he loved the sea and he loved the ability to be out on the sea and he loved to travel by, uh, by boat. So he has a huge collection of, uh, of naval books and uh, naval prints and things. And, um, you know, he drew a lot, I think, uh, of his leadership from the skills that he learned from sailing, you know, knowing when to tack one way and when to tack the other, uh, knowing that regardless of whatever the rough seas are, there are calmer seas, um, you know, ahead, um, you know, knowing when to set sail and to navigate through the difficult and uncharted waters. These are all things that he was able to, to do as president that I think he drew a lot on his skills and ability as a sailor uh, to be able to, um, to do those things. So um, it was very important to him. And of course, he grew up right here along the river and uh, the water very, very important to him uh, all throughout uh, his, uh, his life. Okay. Question about FDR uh, being quoted so much lately. Well, you know, um, FDR was a man of all times, for all times. Uh, certainly a man of his own time, and as I said a moment ago, something of a futurist. And so many of the things that President Roosevelt talked about, so many of the things that President Roosevelt uh, worked toward are so fundamentally um human, so fundamentally part of who we are as Americans, that it makes sense that the, many of his things uh, still ring true uh, today. And um, one of the things that I like about the Roosevelt, both President and Mrs. Roosevelt, is that there are so many wonderful quotes you can go back to with them. Uh, when you're feeling down, when you're feeling a little depressed, when you're feeling a little blue, um, those words really uh, still ring true today. And there are so many um, quotes. I think in our museum, we've got, I think there's something like 36 quotes all across the museum in the different sections throughout the library. And um, you know, those quotes uh, speak to the issues that were going on at that time but still speak to us even um, so much today. And so um, I think that it's a, um, it's, it's, it speaks to the fact that he, he was a guy that was able to see, um, you know, not just his own time, but what he wanted to bring about uh, in, the, uh, in the future. Oh, I see a, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. Well, I would disagree with that. You know, I think sometimes a smooth sea gives you the opportunity to take stock of your crew, take talk, stock of your vessel, and take stock of where it is that you want to go. And so by having a little peace and calm once in a while gives you an opportunity to recharge those batteries. And Roosevelt took advantage of that. In fact, that's what Hyde Park was really all about. You know, he returned there over 200 times as president of the United States. 
And he would come back to recharge his, his energy, to get away from the hustle and bustle of Washington with all the heavy demands and all the, you know, um, pressing issues and such, to get back to Hyde Park where life was a little simpler, where the seas were a little calmer, the seas were a little smoother, and to be able to recharge and refocus and then go back into the stormy seas with a, a well-charted course, a well-honed crew, and a good idea of where it is that, um, that he wanted to, uh, to go. Okay. Any other questions coming through here? Not too many. Let's see. Okay. So that's uh, all the questions that I see coming through here. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this. I'm really sorry about the disjointed presentation and such with the cutting in and the cutting out. Um, presidential libraries are really an important part of our American democracy. They give us an opportunity to study presidencies uh, in their entirety, in their time, um, with the documents, the photographs, the artifacts that, uh, you know, come from that particular era. And it allows us an opportunity to go back and to look at the accomplishments and to look at the, um, you know, the, the problems that presidents faced. You know, sometimes people will say, well, are there, comp is there competition between the presidential libraries? And there really isn't. Um, you know, each of us, each of the presidential libraries, there's 13 currently, um, tell a different story. You know, um, there's only ever been 45 guys that have belonged to the president of the United States Club. And um, each of the presidents that we've had have things that they can be very, very proud of. And each of the presidents have things that maybe they're not so proud of. But the presidential libraries are an opportunity to put those things into some perspective to let folks come look at the documents, look at the photographs, look at the artifacts themselves, and to um, create and form their, their own judgments. So if you are looking for information about American democracy, about, about American presidencies, the Presidential Library is a great place to start. And you can visit us online. Uh, you can come to um, look at about a million pages of documents that we have online uh, through our Franklin uh, search engine. We have our virtual tour. We have our education material. We have our archived public programs. So even though we're not available to you in reality at the moment, we are uh, available to you uh, virtually and online. And so please take advantage of us and um, you know what we have to offer there and come back and visit us again uh, in the future. And in the meantime, please keep your spirits up. Okay, these are tough times, but Roosevelt got us through tough times as well. Okay, and we've been through tough times before. We've had good leadership. We've had good ideas. We've pulled together. We've worked together and we've come through and we're going to do that again. It's the Roosevelt way. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you again sometime soon.